Welcome to the research and policy seminar, Making Banking Systems More Resilient and Stable with Professor Adnat Atmati from Stanford Graduate University. For those connected in Zoom, please choose the language of your preference at the bottom of the menu. Eric Parrado, the Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department at the IDB will be our moderator. Mr. Parral. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon already. I'm delighted to welcome all of you, both here in person and joining us online, to this new research and policy seminar. This seminar series was established to bring together brilliant minds to tackle the most critical issues of our time. We aim to create a bridge between groundbreaking research and practical policy making to develop impactful solutions. And today's seminar is particularly important as it coincides with the 59th IDB meeting of the Network of Central Banks and Finance Ministries. The prestigious biannual gathering unites top policymakers from Latin America and the Caribbean, leaders from multilateral organizations, renewed academics, and global thought leaders. Our focus today is on making banking systems more resilient and stable, an imperative topic as the world navigates a complex economic landscape. We are truly privileged to have Professor Anat Admati here to share her visionary perspectives. Professor Amati, the policymakers and key decision makers in attendance are eager to gain insights from your analysis as they work to steer through today's challenges. Your recognized expertise is sure to illuminate strategies to bolster the stability and resilience of our financial systems. Allow me to share some highlights of Professor Admati's remarkable background. She is the George G.C. Parker Professor of Finance and Economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a senior fellow at the Standard Institute for Economic Policy Research. As a faculty director of the Corporations and Society Initiative at Stanford GSB, she leads the mission of increasing understanding of the intricate interplay between corporations, governments, and society. Her research spans business, law, and policy interactions, governance, private sector, accountability, and financial regulation. Her prolific work has made an indelible impact. Professor Almaty's book with Martin Helwig, The Banker's New Clothes, was lauded as a top book of the year by the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and Bloomberg. In 2014, Time Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world, while Foreign Policy Magazine placed her among the top 100 global thinkers. As I noted, Professor Almaty will share her insights on fortifying the resilience and stability of the financial system. Since the financial crisis, a key question has been how to achieve a steadier banking system while supporting positive macroeconomic outcomes. Potential avenues include strengthening sound financial regulations that enable the private sector to drive productive lending while ensuring robust risk management. Managing carefully the complex interconnections and differing incentives among corporations, bank, and public institutions. Progress on these fronts can contribute to a more shock-proof financial sector with significant macroeconomic policy implications, especially for emerging regions like Latin America and the Caribbean that are the front of our discussion. We keenly await Professor Asmati expert analysis of these complex issues. By the way, for those who arrive early, her latest book is available at the back of the room. And at the end of, of our Professor Asmati's talk, she will have some time for, for signing. So this is good news for us. So Professor Almati, we're deeply grateful to have you with us. The floor is yours. And following your presentation, I look forward to moderating the Q&A session. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Eric, for this introduction. And I'm really, really pleased to be here. And thank you all. The book has gotten a little bit fat since its first edition, so I'm sorry about that, but it is paperback. I do hope that uh, you pick it up, and I do hope that you take it and that you read it or that you give it to somebody else who will read it. Uh, I managed to squeeze a few uh, as I go around just in case I meet somebody who absolutely must have it. Um, 
was written originally in 2013. I'll tell you a little bit more about the the new edition, which is basically added about 200 pages. Just so you know, when you look at the at the uh, length of it, about half of it is in notes and references and uh, index, which are very extensive. So there are multiple levels of reading the book. It's written in such that it gives enough for lay people as well as for experts. Anyway, I teach finance at Stanford. I come to you as a finance expert who for 25 years taught just corporate finance. Uh, and you'll see how I got into this, what I sometimes call rabbit hole of banking. Um, anyway, so I start with my students always telling them what the financial system can do. So very quickly, most of you know it, uh, since you're finance ministers and, and bankers, but there are other people uh, here. Uh, first of all, we need a payment system. We have currencies, the ones that central banks here issue. We have all kinds of other monies that people use for payment. Most of them are some form of private debt, privately issued securities, like deposits. Um, and there are others these days. I won't talk much, about, talk much about cryptocurrencies, but there are other currencies that we can use in different contexts. I can, if I buy, have a lot of miles on an airline, I can use them to buy a ticket. So some currencies are used in some contexts. Uh, we need a payment system that you can trust. We need uh, an efficient payment system. So that's all pretty clear. Uh, the financial system moves money across time. Some people want to save. Some people need to invest or consume earlier than they have the money. And that's what the financial system does. And it's a good thing for both individuals and the businesses that were able to have a financial system in which uh, some people invest and some people um, get funding. I'm not saying just boring because it's not just that market. The other has to do with risk, starting with insurance and then the fact that we can diversify the risk and share the risk more efficiently and that allows us to reduce the cost of funding uh, and to fund more innovation, et cetera. All of this is like very basic finance. Finally, there is sort of the guiding of investment, what should be done what is worth investing in. And here, uh, there's a scrutiny of investors, there is the appropriate funding uh, of it and the pricing of investment. And this it can be to banks or in Silicon Valley, venture capital uh, or any other form of funding. And there's ongoing governance, which has to do with the dynamics of how everything changes. Ideally, the right projects will be taken, the right investments will be made in the private sector. Of course, government, I'm leaving the government out. This is about private sector institutions uh, with the government kind of hovering or central banks or regulators and investors guide investments to be the right one, not too much, not too little. What can go wrong? Well, what can go wrong has a lot to do with conflicts of interest and with asymmetries of power and information. So a lot of this stuff that will be the subject here uh, has to do with some these kinds of frictions and understanding them better. So in developed countries, and you know, so clearly in developing countries, you want the system to be able to do all these things that I said. Can you get too much of this wonderful thing? The answer is yes. And we may have too much of it in developed countries, especially. We have a very large system, very complex system, very opaque system, very interconnected system uh, that includes in particular some very enormous organizations I'll get to at the end, the CIFIs. Um, and it appears to be inefficient and reckless, in fact, it is. So that has become my view of the system we have in the country that I live in, the US right now, and in Europe, the country my co-author lives in. Uh, we're not happy with this glorious system that many of our politicians and of course the people involved in it love so much. So how do we prevent too much finance? Of course, we want to have enough finance. And the keys for just right financing is actually the same keys for developing and for developed countries have to do with education. I, as an educator, I always go back to that. 
Uh, so just basic financial literacy for the people who use finance, uh, it has to be most importantly with the rules of the game. Finance is all about contracts and promises and it's all about, you know, the legal system ultimately or the government rules. And technology, I limit it to kind of payment system, ATMs, uh, mobile banking. These are good things, technology. Uh, we have the technology of, you know, printing the money or whatever. Uh, but effective rules and enforcement, the stuff in the middle is the key, okay? People need to know how to use them. Technology can help, but that's the key. So that's the event that got me interested in banking, uh, the financial crisis of 2007, 2009. When I teach now, the, the students were kids at the time. So it's prehistory for some people, but I think looking around, some of you were around then. Um, so then the, the big tremors, uh, the near implosion of the system were followed by spectacular supports uh, by government and central banks of this system, propping it up, preventing it from collapsing, maybe successfully preventing a great depression, but not yet preventing a great recession and a huge drop in output. So whenever you hear that growth will suffer, if you have the kind of regulation I propose, just remember, this is what led to significant uh, decline in all kinds of things. And a housing crisis in the US and some of the countries in which too much lending for housing took place, that when there was a correction in it, all of a sudden the whole global economy collapsed. Unlike, by the way, what happened when in my part of the world where I come from, there was a correction in, in, in internet, you know, company prices 20, uh, you know, 10 years prior to that. That didn't take down the world, even though a lot more paper profits or assets were lost at that time. So what's the narrative on it? Jamie Dimon, the CEO of, City, of JP Morgan Chase, still around, uh, told the Financial Crisis Committee that stuff just happens every few years. So that's a view of the financial crisis and of financial crisis as a natural disaster. It's a kind of narrative that a lot of people like about it. The 100-year flood couldn't see it coming, send the ambulances, etc. In other words, if, it, if that's the narrative, there's little we can do except for... for uh, some kind of cure when it happens as opposed to prevention. The perennial narrative in banking, liquidity problems, always in the plumbing, always liquidity problems. I'm gonna talk some more about that. Uh, so there was a financial crisis in commission in the US. It actually came out with its report uh, if six months after the Dodd-Frank Act in the US was uh, put into place, the massive law that's still never been implemented fully. And the conclusion of that was that the financial crisis reflected a failure of rules and governance. In other words, the government failed, the institution's governance failed. That it was preventable. It was avoidable, not a natural disaster, even those, you know, some extent these days we can decide where to live or whatever, whether to do climate change uh, or whatever. So a key source that I want to focus, focus on is private debt. Private debt means you know, debt, especially by corporations and especially by banks or by my financial institutions. Um, the the um, excessive uh, borrowing, excessive indebtedness is a big problem and some of it is really uh, solvable, preventable. Uh, we just have to get our world, our world, you know, uh, heads around what's wrong with it and what the limits are of using private debt to achieve policy objectives in general. So how does that work? Uh, that works in for the layperson, most understood in the context of the big loan that people take, which is a mortgage, okay? You could just see how leverage works, okay? Kate buys a house with 5% of it in equity and the rest in debt, mortgage. And I'm showing you with simple numbers here, what happens as the, housing, as the house price changes, okay, in a snapshot. Up by 5% means a 100% increase in her return on equity. So it's huge magnification 
uh, of the upside, which has obviously created a lot of wealth to people in this country as housing prices increased. 10% is tripling her money, 200% return. So that's the magnification uh, on the upside. It's really wonderful, the juicing up of return. Doesn't look so pretty on the downside because on the downside, a 5% decline in the value of the house wipes out the equity and a 10% leads to an underwater situation, underwater, meaning the house will not pay the mortgage if, if uh, liquidated. Okay, so the value of the house is uh, 360 and she owes 380. Why would a default happen? So I mean, I mean, making a distinction here between different things that can happen with a lot of borrowing. First is a default non-payment. So a default is can happen because a borrower in general doesn't have immediate access to cash to pay when due, okay? And a different problem is the one of the ability to pay. Solvency problems have to do with the borrower's ability to uh, fulfill the obligation. Now, solvency problems are trickier than liquidity problems in some sense, but they are intertwined and the confusion between them is part of the problem in diagnosing and dealing with banks. Problem including whether you have liquidity regulations or capital regulations, et cetera, okay? It matters very greatly what the source is. So it matters to diagnose whether the, uh, the borrower is able to pay or unable to pay. Now the homeowner could continue paying because maybe they have money to pay even though they're underwater because they have other assets and other um, and ways to pay even when the house is underwater if they want to live there and maybe it'll come back up. But a corporation in general, including bank, may not. And um, solvency problems are very uh, challenging, even if the debt is due in a while. And so you might not see them uh, because before the debt is due, it really distorts the borrower's incentives because at that point, the borrower is playing with the creditor's money, basically, and the distortions can be enormous. Solvency concerns can create liquidity problems, especially in banking. So that's sort of part of the confusion, but it's really important to keep track of what, what is the issue. Um, so insolvency is tricky because it depends on the valuation of the asset. What does it mean, ability to pay? Ability to pay right now, ability to pay when the debt is due, uh, all the uncertainty in between. Okay, will the assets magically grow and everything will be okay? Uh, or will the assets continue to go down? Distress is somewhere in between when you have concerns about solvency. So here's a balance sheet. Everybody here I'm sure knows what a balance sheet is, but we explain from the beginning, move from a house to a balance sheet of a corporation, and then we're going to move to banks. When that is in place, this is like a truism in all contexts. The borrower and the creditors can be conflicted about control issues. The borrower could control things that affect the lender. And those uh, conflicts can be quite intense around insolvency. Um, so when there's heavy borrowing, the, confl the conflicts of interest are very intense between the borrower and the lender. And the bias is that the borrower starts liking more risk than they would if they were playing with their own money and might underinvest because the creditor takes money first. So there might be underinvestment in worthy projects relative to the ideal of taking all the right investments, and there might be inefficient and risky investments in this spirit of gambling for resurrection. Heads, uh, we all win, tails, you lose, okay? So this is a paper that was published in 2018 that really gives you, those of you who can read the theory Part. It's a theoretical paper on the way corporate leverage in general is addictive in the sense that there is a great resistance by the borrower, by the corporate borrower, by the shareholders of an indebted corporation to any leverage reduction. And leverage reductions includes retained earnings, include issuing more equity, things like that versus an urge to always increase equity, no matter how high 
uh, increased debt, sorry, increased debt, no matter how high the indebtedness already is. So it's not a situation in which you go up to some kind of a static optimum wherever you are. It's up. If a borrower has a chance to increase, to ch change leverage once, they'll always choose up. And that has partly to do with the tax advantage of debt. It's a, it's a fundamental result in corporate finance that is of very important implications for banking, for understanding leveraging banking, and for knowing how to regulate given the economics of leverage in banking. So, um, so that enhanced my own understanding, having taught corporate finance for by then 30 years, uh, appreciate the dynamics of leverage. It's not that you put a capital structure in place once and it's over. It's that you have previous commitments and in light of previous commitments, you make future investment and funding decisions, payout decisions, all decisions on both sides of the balance sheet. And that is true in banking and elsewhere. So here's banking. I'm quoting here from the review of Martin Wolf of our book, just to give you a sense of where we're going. Banks are not special except for what they're allowed to get away with. This is something we said in the preface of, uh, of, our, uh, of our book back then. He claimed that and he was in commissions and all of that. The model is intellectually bright, bankrupt, but here comes the key sentence. The reason that this is not more widely accepted, the reason we haven't solved the problem of the crisis comes in two parts. Bankers are too influential and the economics poorly understood. So I, uh, the fact that bankers are influential is something I can't seem to change very easily. As influential as I am, I'm not as powerful as they are. Um, but uh, the economics, I can try to explain. So a bank balance sheet has cash reserves, loan household, trading assets, and on the funding side has deposits, has other cash, and has equity. So that's... A, balance sheet of a bank, okay? Then there's a the question of putting numbers on it, et cetera, et cetera. So in particular, in the color coding of red debt, green equity, deposits are red. The bank owes the deposits. This is a legal obligation of the bank, however much it doesn't feel like it to the bank. So deposits are part of the payment system and they can create potentially problems because they are demandable. So the bank needs to have the cash in the ATM or able to uh, give the cash. Uh, however, pure liquidity problems with no solvency problems rarely take down a bank, especially nowadays that we have so many liquidity safe, safeguards in place. No, but you're... You're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house, that's right next to yours, and in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a hundred others. I, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? This is a clip from the movie It's a Wonderful Life, uh, which describes a bank run. And it just illustrates the liquidity problems of bank, which is as extreme as the bank, as everybody wants their money at the same time. Now that's very nice for the movies. Mary Poppins has a you know rumor, and people run to the bank and all of that. But that's not what's in the movie. Of course, he's a hero, and he and he pays out of his own money, and ever there's a happy end. Um, in the real world, you know, the central banks will come and. <laughs> or the government and uh, and there'll be a happy ending that way and they'll say no no it's not a it's not a, a bailout somebody else will pay some other banks will pay uh, so runs can theoretically take down a healthy bank this is nice in the models somebody got a Nobel Prize for showing that but that's not what's happening that is not what's happening in any runs that we've seen in our lifetime um, not even much in the depression, but whatever. In any case, we put in place deposit insurance. We put in place um, central banks. Uh, there were in the history of banking a lot of runs of runs before we had these systems of safety net. But uh, right now, if you see a run like we saw in SVB, it's not a pure liquidity problem. That's not what's happening there. Um, here is uh, historical equity levels were just, we just got used to them being low. They weren't even as low. And they, uh, they were 50% with unlimited liability for owners way before when banks were partnerships and depositors didn't have any 
anything else but the assets of the banker to rely on. Then we started the safety net. The more the safety net expanded, the more banks wanted to and could get away with having very little equity. Here's how ridiculous it gets. The CEO of the bank in which I had my money said in 2013, right after our book was published, so now it is included in a new edition, because we have potential self-funding with deposits, we don't have a lot of debt, he said. So I was like, what? He forgot he owes me the money. But what you're seeing here is the fact that John Stumpf, CEO of Wells Fargo at the time, was expressing the sense that even though deposits are debt, and I'm sure he knows that they are on his liability side, the, you know, he may want it to be like a central bank where it's really not, bank notes are not debt, um, that it doesn't feel like debt to him. Because as a depositor, I'm not bothering, I don't have a collateral, I don't have any covenants. So the depositors are really the nicest creditors in the entire economy. They don't even realize they're lending to the bank, but the bank does owe them the money, except the banker can forget. Because um, if he doesn't pay them, then something will have to happen, okay? So here is the visual of the leverage of banks relative to other company coming from a corporate finance where the gold standard is the 100% equity funded firm into banking where it's like almost 100% debt is quite the shock for somebody like me, like, what is going on? I understand they have deposits, which starts them off with a bunch of debt, but 97% or whatever, they kind of, you don't see that. You don't see that with no regulation. So you have to ask yourself, why is it that in the freedom to fund however you want, and despite a tax subsidy of debt, corporate debt over equity, why is it that other companies don't choose to have so much debt? What's the market signal telling them not to have so much debt, unless, of course, they're about to fail? So the, a, a critical concept here is the concept of the insolvent corporation, which is the zombie corporation. In other words, an insolv it's like the insolvent uh, bank homeowner who continues to pay, uh, who doesn't default, who doesn't go into bankruptcy, who doesn't get resolution, okay? The zombie corporation is not a phenomenon you see very much in the private sector, in other sectors, but in banking, sometimes I say it's Monday morning. In other words, we don't even know who's solvent or not, and the truth is, uh, but there are symptoms of insolvency that as a corporate doctor, I think they are show the intense hate of equity is itself a symptom of having very little of it. So the inability to raise equity is kiss of death. If a corporation, and that's what happened to SVB in the end. If you cannot, if no investor will give you a dollar for your equity, you're so deep in the hole because usually there's a little bit of upside. You know, it's an option on the upside. Can't go to negative. So there is a, a dime, a dollar somebody would give you. Maybe not a price you like, obviously, because by issuing more equity, you take on more downside risk. So there is a sort of that kind of a dilution, but it's the proper correction. In any case, you will have a list of behaviors that is very prevalent in banking, um, which suggests that, you know, maybe they're not insolvent, but maybe they're like perpetually close to it, dangerously close to it. And you have to ask yourself, why is that okay with the rest of us? that there is a collateral harm to their distress, default, insolvency, failure. So um, here is a way they deplete their equity, just paying dividends depletes their equity. So there is an immediate way to strengthen the equity, hold those profits, right there is equity money. So one of the things that triggered a lot of us corporate finance people is allowing banks to pay dividends before we really figured out how much equity they should have, given that they had so little uh, before the financial crisis. In the recent events, none of this was a pure liquidity run like you saw, you know, in the case maybe the mortgages were all good and the guy just paid them off and everybody waited for the valuations. They had their equity was wiped out. And that was seen, if you looked in the financial statements, from the losses of value in the treasuries that they bought. Note, the treasury had no credit risk. 
but risk weights and others do not take into account interest rate risk. So investing in treasuries is considered as safe as cash. And at that point, interest rates on treasuries were maybe one and a half percent and other interests were close to zero. So there was a little spread and no other thing to do with the enormous amount of deposits that flew into these banks. And that's what they did, lock them in 30 years for, at a very low interest rate or in the case of First Republic, lending to wealthy borrowers at 2%, 30-year interest only sometime. Sure, that has a lot of duration, if you know the term, that is extremely sensitive to interest rate increases. And sure enough, interest rate increased to 5% more, and uh, the business model was no longer viable. The equity got wiped out months before, but accounting rules allowed uh them to pretend to be balance sheet or technically solvent. So in my STEM terms, or oh, here is the thing, don't worry, it's being done according to accounting rules, okay? So uh, the accounting rules for whole to maturity securities were saying it's okay that they went down in value, I'm allowing you to value them at par because I'm pretending that you're gonna hold them to maturity even though you might not be able to hold them to maturity and their loss of value matters, okay? That's sort of what happened. In fact, uh, they got clean bill of health from their auditors. So do not trust auditors to tell you that something is wrong. Uh, and that's the, the go-to accounting firm, audit firm for the banks in the US. It audited all the failed banks and didn't give any warning. But that, that was true also for Lehman Brothers and AIG and all these other banks before the crisis. Nobody warned. Uh, here is... Uh, Barclays. Okay, we had the guy from Barclays. I don't know if he's here yet. This is from 292 to 2007. So you can see the growth of the banks in deposit in money market fund funding, which is short term debt. Uh, that's just intermediates, you know, it's just a shadow bank that, you know, stands in between and can create fragilities themselves. This is the they, uh, money market funds, which themselves lend to the bank and then other debt. And if you strain your eyes, you see a little bit of equity. So that's how Barclays entered the financial crisis and other banks as well. And that's what happened. Okay, so this is the financial crisis now in 13 seconds, an interconnected system, a lot of contagion mechanisms and all of them pretty leveraged. And here are the bailouts propping up the system. So I created this for a short TED talk I gave. So here it is. Uh, so they tell you, oh, equity is expensive. They say in banking, always say that capital is expensive. If you're more confused by that word, okay, but certainly equity is expensive. Well, why is that? To whom is it expensive exactly? Uh, wh wh how, does this, how is this relevant to, to uh, policy? when you say that, is it social costs and benefit? Is it private costs and benefit? It's very expensive for me that I can't reach into the pocket of somebody and not steal their money, but we decided that's not okay. So that's private versus social. Um, anyway, I know corporate finance and there's only so much that banking is different. It's different that deposits are part of its business. So that's okay. From that point on, everything is the same really, okay? So if you compare the funding, everybody has liquid non uh, long-term assets. And I an mean, innovative company doing a patent on something or, you know, non-liquid assets, long-term assets, nothing different about that. Uh, you just don't see that kind of funding in companies out there, okay? Um, the banks choose to pay, make payouts, lots of companies, uh, don't pay out for a long amount of time. Investors are happy because they invest the money on their behalf, okay? Microsoft didn't pay dividend for 20 years. Everybody's happy. Warren Buffett never paid dividends, kept growing and growing and growing. On the downside is when you see the difference because for other companies, the downside is scary. Creditors will start screaming. Yeah, they will get completely incapable of functioning when they have a lot of debt overhang. Investors anticipate that investors will put covenants in all of that. That's what's wrong and what's different in banking. They start off with such nice creditors and then they can ratchet up their leverage, giving collaterals to new lenders and they have the safety net. So all of a sudden this addiction to borrowing is enabled and encouraged in banking, but not in other companies. The market gives more signal, even though the debt subsidies are also distortive as well. What if there, borrower, Kate, had a wealthy aunt 
that told her, go buy, go borrow, I'll guarantee your debt. Well, now she can get a cheap mortgage. She has no credit risk because the aunt will pay. Now she doesn't need to put a down payment at all. Huh, nice buying a house with your equity. Okay, why not buy a big mansion? Tell your aunt equity is expensive. Of course, she can take her money, put it elsewhere. Okay, so the financial system has enormous safety nets, okay? They come from deposit insurance. They come from treasuries that give them bailout directly. And they come from central banks that where liquidity supports often mask supports for insolvent corporation these days. Um, in the US, we invented all kinds of other government sponsored institutions that have to do with mortgage, with our love of real estate and, uh, and the federal home loan bank, et cetera. So here's the slide. I will, by the way, uh, circulate these slides because I know now that I won't get through, I won't get through all of them, but I'll circulate them and they have links. Okay. So this is an FDIC program that helped the bank pay back TARP, pay back treasury after the financial crisis. And right now with Silicon Valley Bank, the announcement was everybody gets bailed out. Uh, not 80, not 90, not 95% of your deposits, 100% of your deposits or millions or even billion dollars of deposits. And, and then they're going to open up these lending facilities. Note that in a one-year lending facility by the Fed, around the holidays, the interest rate charge was 4.87%. But down in the bottom here, I'm sorry, you see the interest on deposits. This interest on deposit is something for you central banks to watch out for. That's amazing because the banks are not paying their depositors anywhere near that right now in the US. That's pure arbitrage. And by the way, that's money on the sidelines. When they tell you that capital is on the sidelines, no, it's the central bank reserves that are on the sidelines. They are not being lent. And all liquidity requirements are putting money on the sideline or in securities or in governments. So anyway, um, all these uh, the innovations, all the opacity, all this complicated system, I'm just putting all the off balance sheet, this is an IMF paper that says that off, off balance sheet funding is more now than it was before the financial crisis. The Basel committee, I know we have at least one representative uh, of that committee. Basel II was a spectacular failure. Basel III is where we woke up, many of us academics. Uh, under Basel II terms, you won't see there was a crisis. If you look, this is an Andy Heldein, uh, study, if you look at the banks that needed the bailouts and the banks that needed less bailouts, uh, there is no distinction. In fact, they, you know, there's no crisis on this figure. Just to remind you, 2006 was a great year. The banks paid a lot of dividend between 2007 when the crisis already started until through the financial crisis, they were still paying dividends. Uh, and then the 19 largest institutions, the one that, that passed the stress test, were supported by $160 billion, which is about twice the amount they paid in dividend just in the prior year and a half. Um, and the Fed committed trillions and trillions of dollars to loans uh, and grew its own balance sheet. All the tier two capital did not absorb losses. So why they still go around saying that by calling it TILAC it will uh, is beyond me, okay? The market values were telling you who was weak. So if you look at market value of equity relative to total balance sheet assets, that would tell you that Citigroup was a zombie, which it was, needed multiple bailouts. So the Basel II, Basel III comparison is really disheartening because of how little change. Adding a leverage ratio of 3%, I mean, it's laughable, the number. 20 of us academics just to begin the discussion said at least 15% of non-weighted assets would begin to do the right, to correct all these distortions, bringing enormous benefits at no cost that matter, no cost that matters, private costs only to those who somehow got away with having so much risk. The risk weights, I will circulate this, very important to understand. They're baked into the regulation. They are extremely distortive. They are not take into account important risks. They don't take into account co correlations. They're very manipulable, they're very political. They always favor governments over businesses. They favor securities. 
Uh, and they're basically manipulated to optimize and there are great differences. And we saw this discussed in Basel, et cetera, et cetera. So our book was, you know, got a lot of praise, okay? Uh, but, oh, sorry, but didn't make a lot of difference in the end. Maybe it did, but it's hard to tell. So the new edition has a new part. Uh, so in red here is a new part. It's called Undermining Democracy and the Rule of Law. And it does more politics. It does a lot more explanation of central banks and what central banks do and how they get involved in, in sort of supports. Um, and then it talks a lot about resolution and the impossibility of resolution. It grew fat, that's the picture, uh, relative to the old edition. And this is a document we just actually updated a week ago again. So, you know, the emperor's new clothes has an emperor who the child is calling the emperor is naked and the emperor just sort of finishes the parade, at least that parade, before realizing that uh, that he was fooled by these tailors, if you know the story. Um, but in banking, the emperor's meaning all the people, and I don't mean just banker, I mean researchers, academics, you know, obviously the lobby, some politicians, etc. keep marching. And they have a grab bag by now of 44 different things they're going to say. All of them have some flaw or another. And they range from so completely fallacious and false to more subtly wrong, okay? So the big confusion is about which side of the balance sheet you are talking about. This one I can't even get rid of after 15 years. Banks hold capital, set aside reserves. Uh, the implication is it's money on the sideline. There's a confusion between equity on the funding side and reserve on, this, on, on the asset side. So here you have journalists saying capital is a rainy day fund, uh, which is false. This is from January 2024 in the New York Times explaining that capital is a cash-like asset that is false. But the lobby, is, uh, here's a, a, a senator saying, let's translate Basel III endgame. It's money on the sidelines, which means fewer dollars and the end of, whoa, the, end of the, the, end of, the end of the American dream. That's so excited. Um, this is just nonsense, it's false. There's nothing in there about the Kent land. This is JP Morgan Chase has $4 trillion, almost $3.5 trillion, of which $2.5 trillion are deposits. And the loans, what they define as loans, is $1.3 trillion, which is even less relative to the total balance sheet then. They're not even lending the deposits. The loan, your loan, and your loan, and loan loan won't be made. If this, of course, if you think it's capital, that you know, money is on the sideline and somehow prevented you from lending, and there's a minuscule amount of that. And of course, it's very profitable too to lend to the central bank. But anyway, it's all wrong. The lobbyists love this because they have these kinds of lines that say every dollar in capital is a dollar not in the economy. I thought my borrower put her equity into the house that's invested. That's complete nonsense. Rules will keep billions out of the economy. They get this, the playbook, they get it. And this is what, what Volcker said. about any, What anybody proposes, they will say it'll harm, harm credit and growth. It's all bullshit. When I am given only five minutes, that I quote him. So here's the bullshit right now going on. They have a website called Stop Basel uh, Endgame, and they threaten and threaten and threaten. And I have here about credit will suffer. There's too much, too little, boom and bust. We were told to have financial stability. Another too big to fail banks, okay? Uh, do not please believe or anything about loss absorbing debt. That is conceptually, theoretically possible, but why, why? Okay, no, I don't want to actually go through that. So they, they, in the end, they use the yellow say, bailout buttons because there's a physics of finance that there is risk taken somebody's going to bury. And so if it can't be depositors and can't be secure creditors, uh, maybe it's other creditors, it should be equity or it's taxpayers. So there's not somebody, somebody, okay? And here's Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse became a zombie. Credit Suisse was a zombie before. There was disclosure issues. There was all kinds of problems with the banks. And of course, a bailout. And these are the Swiss that told us that there's no more bailouts. And good luck to them. So we have recommendations here about how to make equity work. We aim for levels that make us considered crazy, but we don't think we're crazy. Uh, I have not heard an argument why not to aim at levels like this that will 
reduce all the deleveraging dynamics and that would just make the system stable and able to do all that it needs to do without endangering the rest of us. You just have to get there. So there is an issue there, but we say how to get there, which is to take them by the hand, not through ratios. The leverage ratchet paper says that adjustments to leverage, to, leverage, uh, to ratios are inefficient. There is a tendency to shrink to a ratio. But if you tell them to issue, if you tell them to retain, then you're even letting them grow with equity, which for the biggest one, I believe they will break out of their own inefficient account. It's not a silver bullet, but it's a big important step that we keep missing for financial stability. Again, I will have Eric circulate those slides. They have some links. There's more stuff written. And now this is politics, so I'll say very little about that, but I basically concluded my journey into banking by realizing how political this is. Uh, and then in the politics, there is a level playing field uh, argument and national champions. This plays strongly in the US and UK. Please do not fall for it. Remember, okay, don't be envious at Switzerland. Okay, good luck to them. Banks destroyed Iceland. You know, you don't want a huge banking system. We don't need a huge banking system. In fact, we don't know that we need global banks at all. Bank may, might want to be to a jurisdiction because they cannot fail cross jurisdiction. Really, we show this in the book. Uh, so the summary is that markets fail in finance because of too much private debt, opacity, and conflicts of interest. And the rules are really, really critical there because the incentives are not there. It's not like you leave them unless say fair markets would work and we've written on that as well. Um, here is from Switzerland. I put this in because what matters in the politics is first of all, that regulators have authority to act. In the US, they do have authority to act. They just don't use it very well. So, uh, but in Switzerland, remarkably, we discovered that they didn't, that FINMA, which is their regulator, which is not their central bank, which is also a weird organization, SNB, but never mind that, um, didn't have the authority to do uh, much except ask nicely that Credit Suisse, you know, does something better, but Credit Suisse wouldn't. So they had no tools. And now they're saying we couldn't even find them. Finding it doesn't always work either. Uh, so the authority in the US is recycled through many laws. It's existed forever to do something about imprudent banks. Of course, what's imprudent and why the supervisors are scared, that's all questions to be asked. So in the politics of banking, uh, is very critical more than the politics of other corporations. Banks are where the money is, they're at the center of the system, guarantees appear free, they seem to be a source of funding, they're national champions, the central banks bail out in the middle there. There is ignorance and confusion. What's needed when we ended the book in 2013 was political will. Now, 10 years later, when we started writing this one, uh, we were basically saying you didn't find the political will, and here we are now, and we're more concerned about our democracy's ability to deal with uh, power of private sector. And I think that's a problem for our democracies. It goes much bigger. Uh, so that's my final slides. For policymakers, which you are, and rule enforcers, avoid the urge to be willfully blind and to kick the cans down the road, which is what they're doing right now in the United States, right here in this town. Uh, use your authority in the public interest. Remember who you're working for. The bank is not, is not your customer. The public is your customer. And subsidies more broadly, and this includes fiscal authorities, should be directed better than they are right now and not always through debt. This is even true in the US for student loans and other ways in which we, uh, we provide excessive uh, funds as long as people borrow and then the harms from that fall more disproportionately on, on them as well as on the rest of us. There's too much debt subsidies is distortive and there are other ways to deliver subsidies to the economy. Then through intermediaries like banks or corporations, uh, sometimes say through COVID uh, and, and um, to, to achieve whatever is the objective policy. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs>
this has been fascinating. <laughs> Your presentation full of in, in, insights and and always you you have to think about this because sometimes this discussion is it seems obvious but it's not. I had had the opportunity to to meet Professor Armati a long time ago in 2015 in Davos, uh, Switzerland, and she was provoking at that time. So. Because she was in a panel with uh, private sector uh, people, uh, bankers, and she said more or less the same uh, at that time. So I said, you know what? This is important. We need to have this discussion uh, at the level of central banks and, and, and financial regulators. And you influence many of us. And I have to say, I read the book carefully. I, I listened to you. And we made an effort to move from Basel I to Basel III. For your standard, probably it's not enough, <laughs> but we, we, we try hard to do so. And as you said, it's not only a financial and economic issue, it's also a, a political issue because you have to discuss with politicians to convince, to pass law, to change regulations. And, and the lobby is, is, is pretty, pretty huge, I would say. And sometimes financial issues is not attractive for the political discussion. But at the end of the day, you said, we have to care about the, the citizens who save money in the banks. So I, th I think that's the main message and we, we cannot forget about that. So now we have a couple of minutes for, for, for a Q&A session. So if somebody wants to ask a question or make a comment, a short speech, a complaint, whatever, please, you can do so. Mine is short. Uh, the, the, the question is, how much is big enough? As I, I come from Uruguay, the banking system is rather slow, uh, rather small due to past banking crisis. So private uh, credit in total is close to 30% of GDP. That's surely not, not enough. We have a deficit in uh, long-term financing, peso financing, and risk financing. But then what Sweden did to go up to a ratio of six times GDP in the liabilities of the private sector, that's clearly too much. So in the middle. Yeah, so, so there is a question of the, the sort of overall private debt in the economy or sort of household debt, you know, other other debt. So for, for corporations in general, debt is not that important. I mean, there are some trade-offs someplace, but for corporations that have access to, to, to equity, for small businesses, maybe, you know, they need loans, more bank loans, etc. So it is a concern, SME lending in general, or maybe household lending. The question is, whatever is a policy objective, even in terms of private sector debt, non-financial sector private debt, whether subsidizing the debt of the banks is the way to do it. I mean, I even say if you're going to transmit subsidies, subsidize the equity and not the bank, the debt. In some respect, that's what Canada is doing. In some respect, by having sort of a, lot, a high charter value to the banks, almost implicit equity uh, funding uh, to the banks, they keep the banking system stable. So a lot of that is just it's just a lot of trouble. So for, we say even in the original policies paper that from 2010 that preceded the letter of 20 academics and all the rest of it back when Basel III was signed, uh, we we were saying if you want to subsidize business lending or whatever, you know, you find a way to transmit your subsidies directly to the business. In other words, the bank by saying, you know, give me cheap money and I'll do stuff with it, they'll do what they'll do. They'll maximize their stock price. They will chase return on equity. They'll do all these things. So if you want the subsidies to reach where you want them to reach, then you have to think about ways to do it. Now, lending is maybe a, a thing that banks know how to do. Um, so, you know, you might need the intermediation. I mean, we say this even to people who want to completely disintermediate and have central bank, uh, you know, money there and you still 
But lending is done in this country by shadow banks, not by banks. A lot of it, and they have a lot more equity, you know, mortgage lenders and others. So there's there's no need for it to come from the deposit-taking banks. In fact, the deposit-taking banking banks have reduced their lending. It's all in securities anyway. So in other words, intermediation, if that's what you're talking about, is not the same as subsidizing the bank's debt and having low capital ratios. The banks have a viable business model, they can raise equity. If they don't have a viable business model, then that's a problem. Thank you, Professor Almaty. Do we have more questions, comments? It's lunch. <laughs> it's lunch time, yes. But probably I can add something in terms of this discussion because what, what is the difference between your original assessment of the 2013 uh, book and the 2024 book? What is the balance of risk right now? Is the same? It, it has increased? Um. Probably similar. We're a little more concerned, but um, and not not little has changed. I mean, we quote, we end up with lawlessness. We're saying the banks are above the law because they learned that they can get away with everything. So we're concerned now with with democracy and with political discourse and all kinds of things like that. So we go in the last chapter much beyond banking already. Um, so. You know, we basically remain concerned. We make some, we remake some of the same points. Uh, we're saying we didn't, uh, you know, we had COVID. We're kind of dissecting the COVID. We don't call them COVID bailouts. We we are sympathetic to the need to help the economy, although not always through um, through the corporations and the banks. And 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 we debunk the notion that the bank that the fact that the banks didn't fail during COVID shows that the reform worked. No, they benefited from everybody's bailouts. They just stood in the, in the U.S. They stood in the middle and clipped the coupon out of every business loan that was given. Perfect. Thank you. We have a question over there. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor and Matty, for the provocative thoughts. <laughs> um, from a central bank's point of view, where we have to sort of strike the balance between a financial institution that's systemically important because you touched on, on, on that bit a little bit earlier in your presentation. Uh, how do you see the difference in approach related to CIFIs versus uh, other financial institutions based on the exposure and, and the response? Uh, so so the, the systemic, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank was not systemic in the sense of being connected to the system. What ends up being systemic, so the chapter that we is about sort of contagion called banking dominoes, we explain how, you know, which was also the case in SVB, et cetera, why they were worried about the other banks and why they started lending to the entire system is, you know, it sort of awoken people to first the fact that they were not getting much interest on deposits and they were going to flee for that reason. Secondly, that they were concerned about the solvency of the banks because the banks were not prepared for the interest rate increases. And so they were now had more reasons if they were uninsured to flee. And so, but their solution was the kick the can down the road solution. That's our problem. You, you know, that was like the savings and loan crisis in which for a decade almost, they let insolvent institutions go completely crazy in this country. You don't want that. So the CIFIs are the most dangerous if they are actually recognized as systemic through their direct impact on, you know, touching footprint of, of, on the system. But that just only makes it ever more important to make sure that they don't abuse the privileges that come with being a CIFI. So it's much more important for them to retain their earnings. And I think that CIFIs, to the extent that their size gets to be unmanageable, that they will break once they're in markets. And in markets means in equity markets, just like conglomerates broke up in the 80s that were just, you don't need many lines of business you can be a pure play and the investors can diversify but you know except for you know certain certain risks you know specialization is is okay so if they're too big they should break up more naturally so i'm not in the break them up because i'm not sure how to 
do that, but by increasing equity requirements, you're kind of forcing them to face their risks in, and their opacity to the extent investors don't like it and say like what I have here quotes from Paul Singer, who was with me in Davos in 2014 and said, you know, I cannot evaluate the risk of a big bank. It's a black box. Kevin Walsh said the same. So if they are so opaque and they can only live because they have all these safety nets, we want the investors to tell them that. And so I think by sending them to equity markets, they will have to confront their upside and downside because equity investors will worry about that. So that's the benefit there. So there's financial stability and every other benefit in, in the book from doing that. And by making them retain their profits, they can do more stuff for the economy. That's a good way to finish. So thank you very much, Professor Admati, for your time, your talk, your provoking ideas, and, and for, for, for sure it's uh, food for thought. Uh, so, so many thanks again, and please give a round of applause for Professor Admati. <laughs>